Hey y'all, it's April the 28th, 2015, it's gonna be my last video for the night before I go to bed, I'm getting tired. I thought I would read, go ahead and read out this passage for y'all, because I, you know, like I've been stating, I'm brushing up on the Bible myself, I don't have all the details all in order in my head and I, I've kind of been brushing up on it. Also, I realize that a lot of these children out here, they shy away from the subject or even the word of, of God and Jesus. That when you say Jesus, they don't know what to think necessarily. Usually they don't know hardly any of the stories about Jesus from out of the Bible because they've been bored to death their whole life by preachers and people who are not telling the whole truth because if they were telling the whole story it would be the opposite of boring. A lot of people feel I guess um, daunted by the idea of starting to read the Bible if they wanted to find out about Jesus. They don't know where to start or, you know, I mean, the, the whole Old Testament might seem daunting to them. So I'm going to read, I'm going to read some stuff out of this passage it's in Matthew chapter five. My middle name happens to be Matthew, by the way. But anyway, so in Matthew chapter five, and I'm going to read this part is verse 6. thing is, I gotta say, for this part of Matthew, I mean, just if you start to read, starting on Matthew or probably a number of other places, you're gonna find the birth of Jesus in, in his life. So it's a real good place to start reading because, I mean, it's actually a pretty short read till you get to where he's an adult. But anyways, like I said, it's chapter 5. Verse 6, uh, he states, Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. I wanted to focus on that because he stated, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed the meat for they will inherit the land but you know what he didn't say that at all uh he i mean he said that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness they will be satisfied he didn't say that any of the other groups would necessarily be satisfied he specifically mentioned this group it goes on a couple more verses and then he states again Blessed are they, this is uh, verse 10, blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So right there, he gives, he gives kind of clues that you need to be hungry and thirsty for righteousness. How do you do that? You, you hunger and thirst for knowledge and information because when you get enough knowledge and information, you will have the tools to be as righteous as possible. That's what you got to be hungry for and thirsty for. Anybody who's scared of debates, scared of information, scared of any sort of knowledge outside of their comfort zone, he's basically implying that you're not going to ever be satisfied. Only those who hunger and thirst for it every single day of their lives till they die, only they will be satisfied is what was implicated in that verse. Anyways, he goes on, verse 11. Blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. Now, this has been happening, obviously, throughout the history of Christians. Certain people insult them. Certain people persecute them. We all know this, and... I mean, that's not very impressive, but let's think about this. Everybody knows Christians. 
everybody's experienced certain questions uh, who will go around spouting the name of Christ all over the place. But if you were to have a debate with them, they would be scared lots of times to even have that debate with you. If you were to discuss information with them lots of times, they run from that. There's certain questions. In fact, I would have to say that probably the clear majority of Christians in America don't really want to have the debate. They just want to shout out the name of Christ, and they think, well, if I shout out the name of Christ, I don't need to concentrate on information and knowledge. Shout out his name, that'll be all right. But that's not exactly what these verses are saying. They're saying that every single day you need to want knowledge, you need to want information, you need to be hungry and thirsty for it. So that's it. And so the reason I bring that up is because really what, what he's making reference to is the fact that true Christians, which are the minority now, um, they will be persecuted, in fact, by the rest of the Christians who are not hungry and are not thirsty for knowledge and information. They will be, in fact, insulted and persecuted and all sorts of insults will be thrown by fraudulent Christians to real Christians. That's what was said in this verse. But anyways, on verse 12, he goes on and says, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. He's, re he's referring to the Christians that are persecuted by other Christians. Um, he said, For your reward will be great in heaven. Thus, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Alright, and then it goes on to this passage, and I'll read a little bit from this. It's the similes of salt and light. Shout out to the uh, Salt and Light Brigade with Coach Dave Dobbinmeyer. You should know what that is. Uh, says, you are the salt of the earth, basically. He's talking to these true Christians. He says, you know what? You're the dang nutrient that causes everything to grow and become alive. You're that. That's what you are. But if salt loses its taste, with what can it be seasoned? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out, trampled underfoot. He said, you know what? If you are a true Christian, and you lose your vigor, you're a zest. He's saying, what good are you to me? That's what he just said. I mean, debate me if you think that that's not what he's saying right there. He goes on and continues to say that you are the light of the world. A city set on a mountain cannot be hidden. Pretty much saying, stand tall. And even though you're being persecuted by the majority of the, all these fraudulent Christians, continue, you must continue. You must have vigor and tenacity, is basically what he's saying. And then it goes on to uh, another verse. Verse 17 says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come to not to abolish, but to fulfill. Amen, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or the smallest part of a letter will pass from the law until all things have taken place. Now what he's making reference to is the law of God. It supersedes any sort of human law that could ever be made. A lot of people get technical. They, they might say, well, the, the Word of God comes from the Bible, and the Bible's been translated so many times, then of course, the words and the letters have been changed. I think you might be missing the point. Uh, I, I'm going to throw this out. Of, that The point of that probably would be to, first of all, that the, the Bible is, has to be stringently translated. There's implications here that if you were to translate it, incorrectly or change certain things to fit your certain needs, 
that you would uh, basically go straight to him. So th this is the reason why the Bible is actually, you know, sequenced in such a way with the, the verses being numbered so that people cannot change it. And also, uh, you can't change what you've read out of the Bible. You can't s switch it around to suit your needs after you've read it. To read it, basically you gotta follow it. Now, I'm gonna finish this up. Like I said, Matthew, uh, it's a pretty good book to start reading if you wanna just become acquainted with Jesus and his outlooks on things and his path that he lays before you in order to get where it is you're trying to go. Uh, he basically goes into all these kind of truisms, very true, deep things about how to stay on this path that he's set before you. I'm not going to mention them all. I'm trying to get this under 15 minutes, but uh, one that I find interesting, all for all these Christian, so-called Christians out there who have ever been divorced, who have ever, ever been divorced, this pertains to you, says, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a bill of divorce. But, he says, I say to you now, whoever divorces his wife, unless the marriage is unlawful, and that means unlawful by God, um, causes, this one causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So meaning, um, basically, you can't get divorced. You get married, and there is no divorce. And if there is a divorce, this is what happens. Uh, you're going to start sinning, accumulating sin, and so is the person you divorce. They're going to start accumulating sin. That is unless they stay loyal to you. Uh, and this sin, obviously, is going to lead to the destruction of you. You probably don't want to be divorcing people. That's probably not the Christian way to do it. Jesus said not to do it, and his name was Christ, so that's how that part goes. And, um, shoot, I thought I would finish up on one last thing, uh, or a couple, couple of the last things, if you, if you turn to, um, chapter 7, verse 24, for example, he, he's stating out rules, uh, so it kind of live by, and, and this one uh, refers to God and money. He says, no one can serve two masters. So he, he will either hate one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, which mammon is pretty much like money. Now, it doesn't say you can't get money, have money. It says you cannot love money. Anybody who publicly loves money, who publicly states that they love money, that's not, you're already disqualified. You're not a Christian no more. Sorry about that. You need to get over that. Because that makes you not a Christian. If you publicly even imply that you love money, it's against the rules, basically. Uh, and then, you know, there's all sorts of good ones, but I'm going to end it on this one. Uh, like I say, you're going to be persecuted. A true Christian is going to be persecuted by who? Everybody, especially the majority of other Christians here in America. And on verse 13 of chapter 7, it says, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is, is wide and the road broad that leads to destruction. Like I just said, the, the big road that most of these Christians are going down, according to this verse, leads to destruction. And those who enter it are many. How narrow the gate and constricted the road that leads to life, real life. And those who find it are few. There will be a few true Christians that are persecuted by the majority of not real Christians. The end. Good night. Good night, baby.